This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sheila Morton in Jefferson City, Tennessee. The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. Volume 3, Chapter 6, Section B. Emily was at length roused from the reverie which engaged her by a confusion of distant voices and a clattering of hoofs that seemed to come on the wind from the courts. A sudden hope that some good was approaching seized her mind, till she remembered the troops she had observed from the casement, and concluded this to be the party which Annette had said were expected at Udolpho. Soon after she heard voices faintly from the halls, and the noise of horses' feet sunk away in the wind. Silence ensued. Emily listened anxiously for Annette's step in the corridor, but a pause of total stillness continued, till again the castle seemed to be all tumult and confusion. She heard the echoes of many footsteps passing to and fro in the halls and avenues below, and then busy tongues were loud on the rampart. Having hurried to her casement, she perceived Montoni with some of his officers leaning on the walls and pointing from them, while several soldiers were employed at the further end of the rampart about some cannon, and she continued to observe them, careless of the passing time. Annette at length appeared, but brought no intelligence of Valancourt. "'For, Mademoiselle,' said she, "'all the people pretend to know nothing about any prisoners. "'But here is a fine piece of business. "'The rest of the party are just arrived, ma'am. "'They came scampering in as if they would have broken their necks. "'One scarcely knew whether the man or his horse would get within the gate first. "'And they have brought word, and such news! "'They have brought word that a party of the enemy, as they call them, "'are coming towards the castle. "'So we shall have all the officers of justice, I suppose was besieging it. All those terrible-looking fellows one used to see at Venice. "'Thank God!' exclaimed Emily fervently. "'There is yet a hope left for me, then.' "'What mean you, mademoiselle? Do you wish to fall into the hands of those sad-looking men? Why, I used to shudder as I passed them, and should have guessed what they were if Ludovico had not told me.' "'We cannot be in worse hands than at present,' replied Emily unguardedly. "'But what reason have you to suppose these are officers of justice?' "'Why, our people, ma'am, are all in such a fright and a fuss, "'and I don't know anything but the fear of justice that could make them so. "'I used to think nothing on earth could fluster them, "'unless, indeed, it was a ghost or so. "'But now some of them are for hiding down in the vaults under the castle.' "'But you must not tell the signor this, mademoiselle, and I overheard two of them talking. "'Holy mother! What makes you look so sad, mademoiselle? You don't hear what I say.' "'Yes, I do, Annette. Pray proceed.' "'Well, mademoiselle, all the castle is in such hurly-burly. "'Some of the men are loading the cannon, and some are examining the great gates and the walls all round, "'and are hammering and patching up, just as if all those repairs had never been made that were so long about. "'But what is to become of me, and you, mademoiselle, and Ludovico? "'Oh, when I hear the sound of the cannon I shall die with fright.' If I could but catch the great gate open for one minute, I would be even with it for shutting me within these walls so long. It should never see me again. Emily caught the latter words of Annette. Oh, if you could find it open but for one moment, she exclaimed, my peace might yet be saved. The heavy groan she uttered and the wildness of her look terrified Annette, still more than her words, who entreated Emily to explain the meaning of them to whom it suddenly occurred that Ludovico might be of some service, if there should be a possibility of escape, and who repeated the substance of what had passed between Montoni and herself, but conjured her to mention this to no person except to Ludovico. "'It may perhaps be in his power,' she added, "'to effect our escape. Go to him, Annette. Tell him what I have to apprehend, and what I have already suffered.' but entreat him to be secret and to lose no time in attempting to release us if he is willing to undertake this he shall be amply rewarded i cannot speak with him myself for we might be observed and then effectual care would be taken to prevent our flight but be quick in it and above all be discreet i will await your return in this apartment the girl, whose honest heart had been much affected by the recital, was now as eager to obey as Emily was to employ her, and she immediately quitted the room. 
Emily's surprise increased as she reflected upon Annette's intelligence. Alas! said she, what can the officers of justice do against an armed castle? These cannot be such. Upon further consideration, however, she concluded that, Montoni's bands having plundered the country round, the inhabitants had taken arms, and were coming with the officers of police and a party of soldiers to force their way into the castle. But they know not, thought she, its strength or the armed numbers within it. Alas, except for flight, I have nothing to hope. Montoni, though not precisely what Emily apprehended him to be, a captain of banditti, had employed his troops in enterprises not less daring, or less atrocious, than such a character would have undertaken. They had not only pillaged, whenever opportunity offered, the helpless traveller, but had attacked and plundered the villas of several persons, which, being situated among the solitary recesses of the mountains, were totally unprepared for resistance. In these expeditions the commanders of the party did not appear, and the men, partly disguised, had sometimes been mistaken for common robbers, and, at others, for bands of the foreign enemy, who, at that period, invaded the country. But though they had already pillaged several mansions, and brought home considerable treasures, they had ventured to approach only one castle, in the attack of which they were assisted by other troops of their own order. From this, however, they were vigorously repulsed, and pursued by some of the foreign enemy, who were in league with the besieged. Montoni's troops fled precipitately toward Udolpho, but were so closely tracked over the mountains, that when they reached one of the heights in the neighborhood of the castle, and looked back upon the road, they perceived the enemy winding among the cliffs below, and at not more than a league distant. Upon this discovery they hastened forward with increased speed, to prepare Montoni for the enemy, and it was their arrival which had thrown the castle into such confusion and tumult. As Emily awaited anxiously some information from below, she now saw from her casements a body of troops pour over the neighboring heights. And though Annette had been gone a very short time, and had a difficult and dangerous business to accomplish, her impatience for intelligence became painful. She listened opened her door, and often went out upon the corridor to meet her. At length she heard a footstep approach her chamber, and, on opening the door, saw not Annette, but old Carlo. New fears rushed upon her mind. He said he came from the Signor, who had ordered him to inform her that she must be ready to depart from Udolpho immediately, for that the castle was about to be besieged, and that the mules were preparing to convey her, with her guides, to a place of safety. "'Of safety!' exclaimed Emily thoughtlessly. "'Has, then, the Signor so much consideration for me?' Carlo looked upon the ground and made no reply. A thousand opposite emotions agitated Emily successively as she listened to old Carlo. Those of joy, grief, distrust, and apprehension appeared and vanished from her mind with the quickness of lightning. One moment it seemed impossible that Montoni could take this measure merely for her preservation, and so very strange was his sending her from the castle at all, that she could attribute it only to the design of carrying into execution the new scheme of vengeance with which he had menaced her. In the next instant it appeared so desirable to quit the castle, under any circumstances, that she could not but rejoice in the prospect, believing that change must be for the better, till she remembered the probability of Valancourt being detained in it, when sorrow and regret usurped her mind, and she wished, much more fervently than she had yet done, that it might not be his voice which she had heard. Carlo, having reminded her that she had no time to lose, for that the enemy were within sight of the castle, Emily entreated him to inform her whither she was to go, and after some hesitation he said he had received no orders to tell, but on her repeating the question replied that he believed she was to be carried into Tuscany. "'To Tuscany!' exclaimed Emily. "'And why thither?' Carlo answered that he knew nothing further than that she was to be lodged in a cottage on the borders of Tuscany at the feet of the Apennines. Not a day's journey distant, said he. Emily now dismissed him, and, with trembling hands, prepared the small package that she meant to take with her, while she was employed about which Annette returned. "'Oh, mademoiselle,' said she, "'nothing can be done. Ludovico says the new porter is more watchful even than Barnardine was, and we might as well throw ourselves in the way of a dragon as in his. 
Ludovico is almost as broken-hearted as you are, ma'am, on my account, he says, and I am sure I shall never live to hear the cannon fire twice. She now began to weep, but revived upon hearing of what had just occurred, and entreated Emily to take her with her. That I will do most willingly, replied Emily, if Signor Montoni permits it. To which Annette made no reply, but ran out of the room and immediately sought Montoni, who was on the terrace, surrounded by his officers, where she began her petition. He sharply bade her go into the castle, and absolutely refused her request. Annette, however, not only pleaded for herself, but for Ludovico, and Montoni had ordered some of his men to take her from his presence before she would retire. In an agony of disappointment she returned to Emily, who foreboded little good towards herself from this refusal to Annette, and who, soon after, received a summons to repair to the great court, where the mules, with her guides, were in waiting. Emily here tried in vain to soothe the weeping Annette, who persisted in saying that she should never see her dear young lady again, a fear which her mistress secretly thought too well justified, but which she endeavoured to restrain, while, with apparent composure, she bade this affectionate servant farewell. Annette, however, followed to the courts, which were now thronged with people, busy in preparation for the enemy, and having seen her mount her mule and depart with her attendants, through the portal, turned into the castle, and wept again. Emily, meanwhile, as she looked back upon the gloomy courts of the castle, no longer silent as when she had first entered them, but resounding with the noise of preparation for their defense, as well as crowded with soldiers and workmen hurrying to and fro, and when she passed once more under the huge portcullis which had formerly struck her with terror and dismay, and looking round saw no walls to confine her steps, felt, in spite of anticipation, the sudden joy of a prisoner who unexpectedly finds himself at liberty. This emotion would not suffer her now to look impartially on the dangers that awaited her without, on mountains infested by hostile parties who seized every opportunity for plunder, and on a journey commended under the guidance of men whose countenances certainly did not speak favorably of their dispositions. In the present moments she could only rejoice that she was liberated from those walls which she had entered with such dismal forebodings, and remembering the superstitious presentiment which had then seized her, she could now smile at the impression it had made upon her mind. As she gazed with these emotions upon the turrets of the castle rising high over the woods, among which she wound, the stranger, whom she believed to be confined there, returned to her remembrance, and anxiety and apprehension, lest he should be Valancourt, again passed like a cloud upon her joy. She recollected every circumstance concerning this unknown person, since the night when she had first heard him play the song of her native province circumstances which she had so often recollected and compared before without extracting from them anything like conviction and which still only prompted her to believe that valancourt was a prisoner at udolpho it was possible however that the men who were her conductors might afford her information on this subject but fearing to question them immediately lest they should be unwilling to discover any circumstance to her in the presence of each other she watched for an opportunity of speaking with them separately Soon after, a trumpet echoed faintly from a distance. The guides stopped, and looked toward the quarter whence it came, but the thick woods which surrounded them excluded all view of the country beyond. One of the men rode on to the point of an eminence that afforded a more extensive prospect, to observe how near the enemy, whose trumpet he guessed this to be, were advanced. The other, meanwhile, remained with Emily, and to him she put some questions concerning the stranger at Udolpho. Ugo, for this was his name, said that there were several prisoners in the castle, but he neither recollected their persons or the precise time of their arrival, and could therefore give her no information. There was a surliness in his manner, as he spoke, that made it probable he would not have satisfied her inquiries even if he could have done so. Having asked him what prisoners had been taken, about the time as nearly as she could remember, when she had first heard the music— all that week, said Ugo, I was out with a party upon the mountains, and knew nothing of what was doing at the castle. We had enough upon our hands. We had warm work of it. Bertrand, the other man, being now returned, Emily inquired no further, and when he had related to his companion what he had seen, they travelled on in deep silence, while Emily often caught between the opening woods partial glimpses of the castle above, the west towers, whose battlements were now crowded with archers, and the ramparts below, where soldiers were seen hurrying along, or busy upon the walls preparing the cannon. 
Having emerged from the woods, they wound along the valley in an opposite direction to that from whence the enemy were approaching. Emily now had a full view of Adolfo, with its gray walls, towers, and terraces, high overtopping the precipices and the dark woods, and glittering partially with the arms of the condottieri, as the sun's rays, streaming through an autumnal cloud, glanced upon a part of the edifice whose remaining features stood in darkened majesty. She continued to gaze, through her tears, upon walls that, perhaps, confined Valancourt, and which now, as the cloud floated away, were lighted up with sudden splendor, and then, as suddenly, were shrouded in gloom. While the passing gleam fell on the wood-tops below, and heightened the first tints of autumn that had begun to steal upon the foliage. The winding mountains at length shut Udolpho from her view, and she turned with mournful reluctance to other objects. The melancholy sighing of the wind among the pines that waved high over the steeps, and the distant thunder of a torrent, assisted her musings, and conspired with the wild scenery around to diffuse over her mind emotions solemn yet not unpleasing, but which were soon interrupted by the distant roar of cannon echoing among the mountains. The sounds rolled along the wind and were repeated in faint and fainter reverberation, till they sunk in sullen murmurs. This was a signal that the enemy had reached the castle, and fear for Valancourt again tormented Emily. She turned her anxious eyes towards that part of the country where the edifice stood, but the intervening heights concealed it from her view. Still, however, she saw the tall head of a mountain which immediately fronted her late chamber, and on this she fixed her gaze, as if it could have told her of all that was passing in the scene it overlooked. The guides twice reminded her that she was losing time, and that they had far to go before she could turn from this interesting object, and, even when she again moved onward, she often sent a look back, till only its blue point, brightening in a gleam of sunshine, appeared peeping over other mountains. The sound of the cannon affected Ugo, as the blast of the trumpet does the war-horse. It called forth all the fire of his nature. He was impatient to be in the midst of the fight, and uttered frequent execrations against Montoni for having sent him to a distance. The feelings of his comrades seemed to be very opposite, and adapted rather to the cruelties than to the dangers of war. Emily asked frequent questions concerning the place of her destination, but could only learn that she was going to a cottage in Tuscany, and whenever she mentioned the subject, she fancied she perceived in the countenances of these men an expression of malice and cunning that alarmed her. It was afternoon when they had left the castle. During several hours they travelled through regions of profound solitude, where no bleat of sheep or bark of watchdog broke the silence, and they were now too far off to hear even the faint thunder of the cannon. Towards evening they wound down precipices black with forests of cypress, pine, and cedar, into a glen so savage and secluded that if solitude ever had local habitation, this might have been her place of dearest residence. To Emily it appeared a spot exactly suited for the retreat of Banditti, and in her imagination she already saw them lurking under the brow of some projecting rock, whence their shadows, lengthened by the setting sun, stretched across the road and warned the traveller of his danger. She shuddered at the idea, and, looking at her conductors, to observe whether they were armed, thought she saw in them the Banditti she dreaded. It was in this glen that they proposed to alight, for— said Ugo. Night will come on presently, and then the wolves will make it dangerous to stop. This was a new subject of alarm to Emily, but inferior to what she suffered from the thought of being left in these wilds at midnight, with two such men as her present conductors. Dark and dreadful hints of what might be Montoni's purpose in sending her hither came to her mind. She endeavoured to dissuade the men from stopping, and inquired with anxiety how far they had yet to go. Many leagues yet replied Bertrand. As for you, Signora, you may do as you please about eating, but for us we will make a hearty supper while we can. We shall have need of it, I warrant, before we finish our journey. The sun's going down apace. Let us alight under that rock yonder. His comrade assented, and turning the mules out of the road, they advanced towards a cliff overhung with cedars, Emily following in trembling silence. They lifted her from her mule, and, having seated themselves on the grass, at the foot of the rocks, drew some homely fare from a wallet, of which Emily tried to eat a little, the better to disguise her apprehensions. 
The sun was now sunk behind the high mountains in the west, upon which a purple haze began to spread, and the gloom of twilight to draw over the surrounding objects. To the low and sullen murmur of the breeze passing among the woods, she no longer listened, with any degree of pleasure, for it conspired with the wildness of the scene and the evening hour to depress her spirits. End of Volume 3, Chapter 6, Section B